Well, today is the day that millions of people across the United States spend their day pushing through malls and stores to take advantage of that miraculous sale that has them wanting to spend their hard-earned dollars. It's certainly a day for the retail industry and sets them up for either a successful fourth quarter or not. And with the growth of online sales, you would think that this is all good news for retail, but not so fast. Wharton School marketing professor Peter Fader believes the sharp increase in sales over the Thanksgiving weekend has become a time when the retail industry treats their worst customers like royalty. In an article published on the website Quartz earlier this week, Peter explains why retailers should try and get out of some of their bad habits. And it's a pleasure to have him joining me here in studio. Good to see you. Dan, it's always good talking to you. So why is it, do you think, though, that Black Friday has become, as you say, this day where retail treats their worst customers like royalty? Well, it's to take your earlier words, there are sales, plenty of sales, but there aren't a lot of miracles, at least not for retailers. Uh, because th this focus on discounts, 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 this focus on let's have people line up around the block to get into the store before it opens, that's not the way to grow a business for the long run. That's not a way to either find valuable customers or turn the so-so customers into valuable ones. Those are the kinds of activities that retailers really should be thinking of. And on Black Friday, they're doing anything but. So what do you think has driven this mindset in the retail industry, especially over the probably, what, the last couple of decades? Well, that's exactly the point. Over the last couple of decades, most retailers, most firms didn't have any visibility to really understand the value of, of any particular customer or how those values would differ across customers. But now they do. And now we have the capability to see that, indeed, many of those customers lining up around the store aren't very good. They're not going to buy very often. When they do, it's usually going to be because of a discount. Uh, they don't necessarily have a deep relationship with the retailer. In the old days, it was just, let's just sell stuff. And we would be judged entirely on the volume of stuff that we sold and the cost of doing it. And I'm not saying that those metrics are irrelevant today, but they should be taking a back seat to the amount of ongoing future value that retailers are enhancing or creating. So do you think that retail is aware of this and are they willing to adapt to it? Absolutely not. Uh, retailers would rather, especially this time of year, would rather have their, their heads in the sand. Uh, and it's not entirely their fault. A lot of it is what's being put upon them, both by senior management and external stakeholders, that the uh, you know maximize volume, decrease cost mentality is pretty universal. That's the way they're being judged, so that's the actions they're going to take. So if you talk about the kinds of initiatives that, that I focus on, let's look at the value of customers, and again, and how it varies and how it responds to different kinds of marketing activities. Uh, that stuff is just not on the table at this time of year. And in the article, you do make the distinction between high-value customers and low-value customers, and we've kind of laid the groundwork for the low-value customer, the person that's going to be out there on Black Friday looking for the sales. The high-value customer ends up being what? Uh, either uh, not shopping at all uh, and just kind of uh, riding it out uh, or, or waiting in line with everybody else and being kind of disgruntled, saying, you know, I'm, I'm worth more than this. Uh, so there's a, a real missed opportunity to, to reward those high-value customers. And I'm not saying that, uh, that, that they should treat the, the low-end customers badly. I mean, that's, that's a, clearly a bad idea. But why not reserve a little bit of that time, have some extra hours just for the good customers? It's not that hard to do, uh, and the returns for a small effort like that uh, would be tremendous. So part of that would include, I would imagine, doing fewer sales or the amount of percentage that is given back in, in some of these sales. Cut that back a little bit. Yeah, so it, it, it works both ways. Number one is, you know, let, let's cut back on the discounting. Let's cut back on the hours. Let's cut back on the, the maybe the range of products that are available. Yeah, we have to do something. We have to keep up with the Joneses in terms of having some kind of Black Friday activity. Even Amazon, that, that tends to avoid getting caught up in these kinds of death spirals, even they're announcing some kind of Black Friday thing. Everyone just has to do something. But you don't necessarily want to outdo them by, by doing more and deeper and longer. And at the same time, you want to turn around and look for uh, chances to create a little bit more upside, whether it is with, with special sales or special hours or, or other kinds of, of, of special relationship-enhancing activities for those more valuable customers. Well, one of the other things you talk about is uh, the move by a couple of companies to not even be open on Black Friday. 
REI is one that, that you mentioned in, in your piece, that they close their doors. Uh, they do not let people shop in sight. They don't even allow people to shop online. And obviously the employees are getting the day off with pay. I am such a fan of the of what REI has done, and and for them it it was almost a gimmick a few years ago when they had hashtag opt outside, uh, saying we're going to give everybody the day off, uh, shoppers and employees alike, and we're going to encourage you to go out and play, which is what uh, REI is all about. It was just brilliant. It, they 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 kind of won on on both sides of the coin. Uh, it was the way that they did it was very natural and, and not in, in some kitschy way. And it's kind of ironic because REI is, and I have great respect for them, but they're not one of the more sophisticated companies when it comes to figuring out the value of individual customers. It's not like they did some lifetime value calculation and said, you know, this will be good for business. They just did it because they felt right about it. And I think that their, their feelings were entirely appropriate in this case. So the reaction by the by the employees of REI is obviously they are happy because they don't have to work on Black Friday. What has the reaction been by the consumer, the people that follow REI and buy from them? Because this kind of messaging, this kind of activity is so consistent with what that company is about, as I as already said. Being outside, doing things, but also being a little bit less about kind of crash commerciality, less about discounts, discounts, and more about quality and relationships. And, you know, a lot of people really do see REI as a, as a trusted advisor, not just a place to buy things. Uh, that's the kind of status that, 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 that all retailers should want to obtain. But Black Friday is about the worst way to do it. So, so doing something that's really unique and on brand, uh, as REI has done in that case, and some of the, the, the follow-up activities to it, it, it's just tremendous. And it's surprising, almost dismaying, that more companies haven't really seen that and tried to find some way of doing something similar in their own quirky way. Well, you mentioned also that Nordstrom's, I guess, is doing a version of this as well, correct? Well, it's not the same as, as the opt-out side, but it is a, a bit of, uh, of divide and conquer. Let's try to focus a little bit more effort on the low-end part of the Nordstrom empire. Uh, you know, more about the, the, the whole rack uh, aspect of it and, and less on the main store. I think that's smart. I think because there, there are a lot of very loyal Nordstrom shoppers, uh, and many of them aren't necessarily looking for discounts. They, they do want to buy things. Uh, they want some help. Uh, they, they, they'd like uh, to, to be able to kind of get around the store and, and, and get treated well. So by uh, by shuttling a lot of the, the lower value stuff off to different stores, uh, it's a nice way for, for Nordstrom to, to play the game, but at the same time enhance relationships. But the company still has to be very w well aware of the quality of the merchandise that they're putting in these different pieces to the business. Uh, indeed, they do. And, and which goes back to the point of, of what kinds of merchandise do you put on sale? This isn't an issue just for Nordstrom, but for everybody. Do you put the really good stuff on sale? Or again, is it just a, a tipping your hat? Yes, we're going to do, we're going to put some stuff on discount, but it's the stuff that's going to be, well, frankly, more appealing to the low value customers. Uh, and again, uh, just giving them a, an opportunity to to fight over each other to pick up those, those, those bargain items while trying to give a, a more pleasant, more uh, um, you know, value-added uh, 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 experience to the more valuable customers. How much does the actual demographic of who they are marketing to play into these decisions of whether or not to have these cuts or not or to pull back? I mean, obviously, the, the baby boomer generation is probably a much different shopper than the millennial generation. And you wonder if the mindset, if the expectation is different. Actually, I disagree with that. Uh, it, it's not clear to me that some of these uh, generational stereotypes uh, carry any water at all. Uh, for, the, for the most part, there's tremendous differences among baby boomers. There's tremendous differences among millennials and Gen Xers. Uh, so I, I'm not a big fan of those kinds of uh, millennial personas or uh, efforts to market them, especially at, at this time of year. In general, demographics aren't very predictive, which is why this becomes an even bigger challenge, that if we could offer uh, you know, some kinds of discounts or activities to some kinds of people, but other discounts and activities to other kinds of people based on easily observable, e easily measurable characteristics like their age, uh, life would be a lot easier. But the point is that within any any slice of, of demographics, there, there's tremendous tremendous differences across customers and really hard to tell who the valuable ones are from the less valuable ones other than looking at their past shopping behavior. So do you think then with the REIs of the world and the, and the Nordstroms of the world making these changes and obviously also being in the era of big data, 
that the potential is there, whether or not retailers actually take advantage of it, but at least the potential is there to have some significant change in the mindset of Black Friday and where this idea of a quote-unquote holiday is going to go. Yes, indeed. The potential is there. That's one of the frustrating aspects of it, that it's more than potential, that at other times of the year, there's a number of retailers that who are doing smart things by understanding the difference across customers and using it to drive messaging and, and product development and even store layouts and locations. But all that goes out the window for these uh, these couple of weeks, and especially for today, Black Friday, when it's just all about volume and cost. So I really think it has to start at the top, which means the executive level and the external stakeholders to send a signal that, you know what, we're not nearly as reliant on Black Friday as we used to be, or at least as, as we as we improve our measurements and we can we can rely a little bit more on the value of customers and not just tonnage of dollars that comes in today. Uh, that we could kind of take our foot off the gas a little bit, and that would be for the benefit of absolutely everybody. And, and obviously also part of that story is the timing of the year being you know, usually a week before the end of the, the calendar year, which in many cases is the end of the fiscal year for a lot of companies. They're just trying to cram in that last good week of sales before the numbers have to get put to, put to bed. Exactly right. That that retailers, like so many companies, are are end gaming it, uh, and and it just so happens that that this is an opportunity to to make it all look good. And if instead we can measure them just on the the, the value of the customer base at that time of year, not just necessarily the dollars that have come in just before the alarm goes off, uh, but but how much how much financial goodwill is there in the bank at that point? I think that would be to to everyone's benefit. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned that because of the fact that we do see some retailers who are, it seems like, trying to make the change of mindset, understanding that the value of a customer is so important. I mean, we've kind of gone from having the value to not having the value. Now we're kind of cycling back, it seems like. Indeed, indeed. And as we come half circle, um, a lot of those D to C, a lot of those direct to consumer digitally native firms are much less engaged with this kind of Black Friday activity. That's a good thing. Uh, that they are operating by a different kind of business model, and I hope that they can maintain that. I hope that 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 the same pressures that, that hit all the traditional brick-and-mortar ones, um, uh, there's some of that to be sure. And again, they have to do some kind of uh, advertising promotion just to stay in, in customers' minds at this busy time of year, but it's not nearly an emphasis for them as it is for their uh, el elder brethren. So I, I think we are starting to see a shift, at least on the part of the retailers themselves. Now we just need again, the, the, the stakeholders uh, to, to catch up, and even for customers to not have those same expectations about bargains galore. Peter, great to see you. Thank you for coming in. Have a happy holiday, Dan. Peter Fader, Wharton Professor of Marketing here, joining us here on Wharton Business Daily.